Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Witts and I'm the Senior Curator at the Auction Museum. And I'd like to offer you all a very warm welcome to the third of our expert lectures, which coincide with the Auction Museum's exhibition, The Rydale Horde, A Roman Mystery. These aim to offer a bit of deeper context for some of the themes and ideas in the exhibition. And I'm thrilled that today's speaker is uh, Professor Martin Millett uh, from the University of Cambridge. Before we get into Martin's talk, I just want to say that the Rydale Horde exhibition is currently on display at the Yorkshire Museum in York. It places the uh, frankly amazing Rydale Horde um, uh, on display for the very first time and contextualizes it with some of the outstanding objects from other parts of our collection. If you wish to see it, then you can find tickets on our website and the exhibition is open until spring 2023. For today, there's three very little bits of housekeeping before we get into the talk. The first is that this is being live streamed on YouTube and you can ask questions in the comments at any point during the course of the talk. And then I'll talk, ask some of those questions of Martin at the end. So please do add them as we go through. The second is the talk that will be also be available to view again afterwards, again via our YouTube channel. So please do tell a friend if you've enjoyed it. And the third thing is um, we've been battling technology a little bit this afternoon. So I'll be advancing the slides um, uh, on Martin's uh, at behalf, um, very much a problem in York on our side. So then, admin aside, I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Martin Millett, who is the Lawrence Professor of Classical Archaeology at the University of Cambridge. Um, Martin has uh, undertaken groundbreaking work across Europe, but has particularly focused on the landscapes of Roman Yorkshire. He's led on projects and publications on the Wolds and at Aldborough most recently. And his current project is entitled Roman York Beneath the Streets and aims to look afresh at the archaeology of Roman York, um, something we're all very excited about. Today, Martin will be drawing on all the aspects of that expertise with a talk entitled The Context of the Rydale Horde in Roman Britain. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to you, an audience, even though I can't see you today. And what I want to do is to pick up on uh, some of the themes that are touched on in the excellent exhibition that I visited a few months ago uh, to think about uh, the Rydale Horde in a broader context. I probably oversold the talk by calling it in the context of Roman Britain. Uh, I'm going to focus, as you will see, on aspects of uh, the more regional context. Um, and I want to try and take you through some thinking that helps us place the horde in its broader context. So if we kick off with the slides, um, I can see those uh, fantastically, uh, Andrew. Um, could, that's lovely. Now, there's been a lot of thought that has represented in the exhibition that have gone into thinking about the Rydale objects. And that represents a um, way of thinking about material from Roman Britain that starts from the objects themselves, drawing on comparisons from elsewhere in Britain and the empire, and thinking about the objects intrinsically and uh, if you look at the account of the Rydale Horde on the uh, Portable Antiquities Scheme uh, website, uh, where John Pierce and Martin Hennig have looked at the objects, um, you can find, in a sense, no better uh, pair of scholars to look at the nature of the objects, what they represent, both visually and functionally, and thinking about what that means suggesting potential interpretations that are in, included in the uh, very excellent exhibition at the museum. Is it a hoard of things that are buried uh, because they're valuable? Is it a hoard of things that were buried because they were no longer valuable as scrap? Is it a religious deposit? If it is a religious deposit, was it buried at a temple or at some other special place? Now, as I say, Martin Hennig and John Pierce have done excellent thinking about that. And uh, although my uh, 
expertise lies in Rome and Britain, um, I can't better them in their thinking about them as intrinsic objects. So what I want to do is um, approach the Rydale Horde from a different perspective, thinking about um, landscape, context, and what the objects might represent in terms of the way that the population uh, living in um, our area in the Roman period uh, were doing, how they were behaving. Before I do that, I just would make one observation about the uh, the wonderful um, bust head uh, that we see on the screen now from Rydale, uh, which is um, a indigenous style rendition of a Roman emperor. And uh, that very striking object um, seems to me to have quite a lot of parallels with the equally striking face pots that were made uh, particularly um, in Ebor Ware in uh, York itself, and are found across the north of England. And that is an aspect that if I were setting a student uh, to work on the Rydale object, is a direction that I think is worth pursuing further. Why are emperors presented um, in this indigenous style in different materials? and how were they used. And I'm always reminded with the Rydale uh, head of the rather fine um, plaster bust of about the same size that sits um, in my hall, uh, which I bought in Kenya, um, that represents Barack Obama. And it represents Barack Obama um, in uh, an indigenous African uh, art form as um, a powerful person uh, from outside. I think there's a lot to be uh, pursued in that. But rather than getting carried away with these um, rather uh, amateur thoughts on classical and uh, indigenous art, um, if we turn to the next slide, what I want to do is to um, try and introduce what I would call a contextual approach. Now, um, the Rydale Horde comes from um, the parts of the uplands of uh, Roman East Yorkshire. But I'm not only concerned where it comes from, and I'm not going to give away the exact fine spot for you, but where it comes from in a generic sense, but what its rural location in the uplands may mean for its interpretation, and um, how we can think through some of the ways in which the people in that landscape were living and potentially uh, using and interacting with these fantastic objects. But in order to do that, we need to step back just for a moment and reconsider some of the uh, accepted understandings of uh, Roman Britain and the countryside. Next slide, please. And if we um, stand back from the north of Roman Britain and think, what do people talk about when they uh, think about northern Britain in the Roman period? And firstly, there is a great emphasis on the military. Hadrian's Wall, the fortress at York itself, um, the uh, other forts, uh, military installations, that occupy North of England. They're important and they have been at the center of scholarship. Secondly, there is a focus on urban centers, the other parts of York away from the legionary fortress, um, the settlement, the town at Aldborough, for instance, that I'm working on at the moment, um, and the lesser urban sites, the smaller centers, places like Moulton and Catterick and so forth. And they characteristic there is of um, major urban sites uh, with uh, the paraphernalia of Roman towns that we see across the empire, big public buildings, uh, major uh, structures, major works of art, things like mosaics, uh, representing the 
uh, introduction of those Mediterranean ideas to Britain, but in the context of Northern Britain, being particularly associated with the interface between military and civilian. Much less work has been done until recently on the countryside. And when that work has been done on the countryside, the main emphasis has always been on um, the uh, elite houses, the villas. We have uh, the villa at Langton, for instance, on the screen, uh, dug in the 1930s, uh, with the emphasis again on what is Roman about them, their mosaic floors, their underfloor heating, the types of um, sort of accoutrements of Roman living that are found on these sites. And that um, three elements, the forts, the urban centres and the villas, have been the main focus of uh, interest. But over the last few years, next slide please, there has been a um, growth of interest and a burgeoning of new evidence for rural settlement. This takes a number of different forms. Um, on the main map on the slide here, we have the results of the work by uh, what is now um, Historic England on ephthography, looking um, like an outbreak of measles, um, the numbers of Iron Age and Roman uh, rural settlement sites that have been discovered from the air, as for instance, on the one on the bottom right here, um, at, uh, Burnby, uh, near Pocklington. And what has come out of this um, new evidence, uh, which is far more uh, important from the air, and as we'll see at the moment with geophysical prospection um, in our region than the developer funded work uh, that has been the focus of much that's gone on in the south and southeast of England. Uh, in our area, developer funded work has explored a lot of uh, Roman rural sites, um, but the density of that exploration because of the density of development has been much less than in the south. Nonetheless, uh, what we're seeing across the whole of Roman Britain, including um, our areas in Yorkshire and elsewhere in the northeast, is an appreciation of a much, much higher density of rural population than has previously been uh, considered. And that rural population is not, for the most part, uh, now seen as living in uh, the villas and the big stone houses, but much more an emphasis on small farmsteads, many of which were just um, little farms with timber buildings, uh, often enclosed in uh, earthwork ditches and so forth, as the one in the bottom right hand corner of the slide. And what this tells us, as we think about the context of the Rydale Horde, is that um, we shouldn't be thinking of it as being somewhere isolated in those um, Yorkshire uplands, but something that will most certainly deposited close to uh, exiting settlements. So in mo across most of the landscape we're talking about, um, you would be uh, within a few hundred meters, perhaps at the most a kilometer of your nearest neighbor. So th we're not thinking about a landscape as was thought in the 1950s of Roman Britain with uh, woodland and uh, un unoccupied land, but rather, a densely, totally occupied landscape, uh, different from today, but comparable in the extent of land use. The other thing that's important about that and the density of rural settlement is that it changes our perspective on the communities who are living there. And importantly, in the north of England, it shifts the balance of population from being one that is associated with the army, although there are uh, tens of thousands of soldiers in the north of England in the Roman period, 
and it shifts the emphasis away from the urban centers, which were probably by modern standards, comparatively low densities of occupation. And it shifts the balance of understanding Roman Britain to being an understanding of it as a rural population with probably 95% or more of the population, 95 people out of 100 living on small farms in the countryside. Next slide, please. And um, illustrating one aspect of this with Dominic Powsland's work in the Vale of Pickering, where we see on the screen running across from one side to the other, a trackway with uh, facing onto it, um, a whole series of enclosures, um, most of which are occupied by small farms, or other settlements. And we begin to see um, not a population who are isolated and separated from each other, but of populations who were across the countryside, living in close proximity to their neighbors, forming um, rural communities uh, that are themselves dynamic and uh, probably very creative, as well as uh, being heavily engaged in the exploitation of the landscape. And this then enables us to think about um, the way that um, the objects like the Rydale Horde uh, were used and deployed by these sorts of people. Before turning um, to think about that a little bit further, it's also worth pointing out um, that the exploration of that these landscapes through, in particular, geophysics and aerial photography is giving new understanding even to the uh, more elite settlements. In Dominic's uh, image here of the Vale of Pickering, um, I think we uh, envisage a population made up of people farming the areas around them, probably people who were um, independent farmers uh, rather than uh, tenants on estates, um, much more like a sort of medieval peasantry um, than uh, has often been thought of Roman Britain. When you feed into it, next slide, the um, <clears throat> extent of uh, the big villas, um, we begin to see the villas in a new landscape. And this um, survey from uh, work by uh, one of our PhDs uh, recently completed here, Eleanor Mao at um, Harpham, uh, we can see that uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, um, Ellie's uh, geophysics and her interpretation of the Harpham Villa that was excavated in the early 20th century and then again around the 1950s, um, placed in the context of um, its farmyard and uh, adjacent buildings. And on the right hand side, um, her integration of the interpretation of the geophysics with the air photographic evidence, showing that it sits um, on the corner of a crossroads of trackways um, which is at the centre of a massive uh, uh, group of uh, farmsteads, presumably agricultural um, settlers, agricultural population, who are uh, presumably, in this instance, dependent on the larger landowner. But it gives a really clear impression for me that the villas are not um, isolated, they are part of this um, continuous landscape of settlement. And um, what distinguishes these landscapes um, in a lot of the uplands of um, Yorkshire, certainly uh, the, the Wolds and adjacent areas, is the combination of settlements in enclosures along trackways with what appear to be uh, large tracts of um, open land in between that are presumably used for um, uh, grazing uh, stock and a sort of economy that is based on 
um, the large scale uh, running of sheep, uh, as well as uh, to, to a lesser extent cattle. And that begins to bring in the other aspect of the countryside that I think is uh, only now becoming uh, fully, more fully understood. And that is that the countryside isn't undifferentiated. It is differentiated by different forms of agriculture and different forms of production. And that leads to my next slide, which is that away from the uh, uplands uh, in the lowlands, um, there are um, a diversity of different forms of rural population and different forms of production and settlement. Um, so what we see um, in these slides are uh, around the Holmon Spalding Moor area where we did work um, 30 years or so ago. We have evidence for the exploitation of uh, metal resources, uh, creating um, this huge slag heap in the upper left image, uh, which is um, an Iron Age smelting site where they've been using the iron ore from the uh, bogs around uh, that area of the lowlands. Creating what's a, an industrial rural landscape that is transformed in the Roman period as the iron ore deposits run out into a potting area where we see one of the uh, uh, Holmos Balding Moor Roman pottery kilns that produced grey wares that were transported over the whole of northern England. And those technologies of uh, iron, potting and so forth are dependent to a very large extent on um, not on open landscape but on managed woodland, uh, the coppicing of uh, the areas that weren't great for arable farming producing uh, woodland that could be used to charcoal for these industries. And what this leads me to um, think about is the way in which uh, these different landscapes across Yorkshire and elsewhere in Roman Britain uh, were to some extent specializing in production of different things. So uh, arable crops, uh, animal husbandry, things like pots and iron working, and in the Pennines, things like lead and silver working. And this creates um, complementarities, the way in which um, the person living on the bowls um, is going to need iron and pots and charcoal, and so forth, that they're not producing themselves. So we get um, the flows of things that are being produced in the countryside, uh, moving from one area to another. The other aspect, if we move on to the next slide, that I think is important to build this picture is understanding not only that there are complementary uh, productions and requirements amongst this rural population, but there are also different modes through which um, those connections can be made. At a grand scale, the Roman networks in the north of England are represented by the Roman roads, the roads linking uh, the urban centres, uh, the lesser rural centres, uh, with the military infrastructure and importantly the river mouths and uh, maritime communication. So places like uh, York and Aldborough are um, reached uh, by both river and by road. And those road networks are effectively the um, links between uh, the Roman imperial infrastructure and the rest of the Roman Empire. And they're complemented um, at a local level by those networks of trackways and so forth that we were seeing um, in the Harpham image uh, just now. But it's the main road networks um, that uh, in the north of England in particular, but elsewhere in the province as well, um, seem to attract um, an enormous amount of 
economic activity and uh, population. So if we turn to the next slide um, from the Rural Settlement in Roman Britain project, uh, which shows the distribution of uh, Roman rural uh, roadside settlements, um, the blobs, um, uh, sorry, I haven't got uh, access to a pointer here, uh, but you can see the Roman roads uh, popping out through the distribution of the roadside settlement. And um, what I would say is that the Roman Rural Settlement Project has uh, made an excellent job of drawing on the developer-funded stuff. It underestimates the importance of those uh, roadside settlements, which in the uh, north of England seem to me to be um, absolutely central to what's going on. And I think uh, this map is probably only showing a quarter or maybe a third of the ones that I know about in at the north, uh, which are uh, running along the arterial routes. And um, I'm reminded very much here of uh, when I was driving through um, uh, North Africa uh, many years ago, um, and you sort of stop your car at an apparently um, unoccupied uh, area of the countryside to sort of uh, take a break and um, people emerge from everywhere to the road and they want to sell you things, they want to talk to you and so forth. I think the roads network in Roman Britain does the same. You can imagine the um, trader, for instance, moving up to the frontier from York up via uh, Aldborough and up to Catterick, um, stopping at the side of the road and uh, the population sort of attracted to them. And what we then see through the Roman period is the roads acting as a magnet for more permanent settlement. And we can see that very clearly in the next slide in a couple of examples of the roadside settlements that I've been involved in um, exploring. Um, at Shipton Thorpe on the left-hand side, where I hope um, on the air photograph, you can just see the faint uh, line of the uh, Roman road uh, flanked by ditches uh, running from sort of uh, seven o'clock to one o'clock. Thanks, Andy. Um, and on either side of it, a series of um, uh, ditches of enclosures, very much like those we were seeing along the trackway uh, in the Vale of Pickering. And on the right-hand side at Hayton, we see the same Roman road, um, only five miles or so further along, uh, with, um, again, concentrations of uh, settlement enclosures and so forth, um, attracting um, industry uh, markets and so forth uh, to them. So the roads become um, a magnet of settlement, uh, which must represent um, both a very large um, econom economy and a very high density of population. And those populations along those roads are um, very closely integrated with aspects of the Roman state. And if we move to the next slide, um, at Hayton, uh, where um, we investigated a whole series of uh, sites, both on and off the road, what we see is um, interaction between the local population and, if you like, the Roman state, represented uh, very clearly by um, the sorts of objects that are turning up. And on the right-hand side of this image, we have, um, uh, I hope Andy can point, button and loop fasteners that are uh, associated with the uh, Roman uh, military, uh, uh, spurs, which are almost certainly uh, late Roman uh, cavalry uh, fittings, um, uh, lead ceilings, which in this case have military associations, and then a whole series of um, different types of objects, miniature axes, uh, the cockerel, uh, enamel brooches, um, that represent the sorts of things that um, the fashionable uh, people of the north of England in the Roman period uh, were using, uh, wearing and uh, using for religious purposes. 
But there are along the road at Hayton enormous concentrations of this material, much more than can be represented simply by the local population. And what we concluded here is that um, they represent, have probably represented uh, a large scale uh, marketing center, not only for the people going along the road, traveling from Bruff to York in this instance, but also coming in from the countryside uh, around about. And interestingly, at Hayton, uh, one of the large collections of these objects uh, came not from um, the settlement sites themselves, uh, but from apparently an open area beside the road where it crosses the stream, which we um, concluded was uh, probably forming some sort of periodic marketplace. And in those uh, contexts, um, I think we uh, need to go back and read um, our, uh, our Hardy, uh, the, the, the periodic markets in Wessex in the late 19th and early 20th century, the way that people came uh, together for social as well as economic purposes at different times of the year. And these open uh, marketing places in the context of Roman Britain seem to be uh, attached to the road system. So what these roads are doing is forming um, a focus for interaction and uh, the way in which that uh, interaction is represented archaeologically by the find. But we'll take a look at another aspect of this uh, Hayton landscape in the next slide. Um, we see uh, not on the road itself, but within um, uh, a few hundred meters of the road, um, one of the many rural farmsteads. And these farmsteads are focused on the valley that connects the lowlands of uh, round Holman Spalding Moor uh, via the Funa Valley um, up into the Wolds itself, which you can see uh, beautifully illustrated on Peter Hulkin's uh, photograph at the bottom right. And um, in the context of the Burnby Lane site we excavated here, you could see um, a lot of evidence for the rural economy and in particular um, the exploitation of um, sheep. And uh, the exploitation of sheep. Uh, which were probably uh, raised uh, not in the immediate locale site, but elsewhere, was um, exceptionally represented at Hayton by um, a huge number of uh, animal burials <coughs> or partial animal burials, which were not um, sort of uh, accidental. The image on the top right shows one of the very curious uh, animal deposits uh, where we have um, three sheep's heads um, buried in a single pit with the forelimbs of the sheep uh, laid across the noses of each of them and then uh, buried uh, with clay uh, on top. So these are big careful deposits that I'm sure are uh, have a religious aspect to them. And um, what is interesting about these is that they uh, seem to represent uh, the uh, one stage in the agricultural cycle uh, when I suspect the sheep are being brought down from the wolds to market and they're um, being corralled by the side of the stream, uh, possibly lambing uh, also by the side of the stream. But what this uh, represents is uh, not something that's static, but it's something that is connecting the um, lowlands and the road system with the uplands. Now, this may be uh, partly seasonable. Um, the uh, issue of transhumance, where you move animals from upland to lowland seasonally for lambing, uh, for uh, butchery, uh, to take advantage of the um, spring pasture by the streams and the lowlands, the summer pasture on the hills. Uh, the detail of that, in a sense, doesn't matter. But what it emphasizes is that um, these rural populations are using the whole landscape and they're connecting with each other. And you can 
uh, perhaps envisage uh, the people raising the sheep on the wall top, uh, bringing, coming down to uh, the road uh, seasonally uh, to market them or to lamb them and getting their pottery and their ironwork and so forth from traders who are producing it um, in other ecological niches across the landscape. So we begin to see um, the complementarities of industry, the complementarities of agricultural landscapes reflected in the nature of the settlement pattern. And if you will then indulge me, I'm going to move up onto the walls to look at the way in which um, one of the sites um, that we have looked at at Thwing, um, the far edge of the walls, next slide please, um, might fit in with this. And at Thwing, um, we uh, excavated on the chapel field site, um, a Roman building, not quite a villa, but a um, quite a posh um, sort of hall type building. Um, within one of the ladder settlements, these settlements that are made up of strings of enclosures uh, along the margins of the uh, open pasture. And we also investigated uh, through geophysics um, the another part of the same complex on the Willie Howe site, uh, which overlooks the Great Walled Valley and looks down on the um, Great Neolithic Mound at Willie Howe itself. Now here we had um, a much more uh, rural landscape than you see down at Shipton, Thorpe and Hayton. And I tend to think of it as the, the other end of the connections. If the, um, I take this as a metaphor rather than the detail, because I'm not saying that the people from Thwing went to Hayton. I'm saying that uh, on the tops of the walls, there are one group of people um, who are connected via the local valley systems and local trackways with the lowlands. But the, uh, it illustrates the complementarity uh, in a theoretical sense rather than in the uh, one is at the, the other end of the same trackway. But here at Thwing, um, we see, um, as in the Vale of Pickering, linear settlements largely populated if you like by the middling sort rather than the elite so though there's the big villa uh, adjacent at uh, rudston a few uh, kilometers away and here um, we see apparently a population who are uh, largely engaged in uh, raising animals, although they're doing a little bit of um, arable farming as well. And what then becomes very surprising um, to us, if you turn to the next slide, is on the Willie Howe site, um, where there's been some very careful uh, work um, uh, with uh, metal detecting, as well as uh, field walking, um, we find um, a very rich assemblage of um, Roman objects. Um, the top right-hand corner was one of the things that first drew my attention to the Thwing area, which is the base of a candelabrum uh, that uh, is very, very difficult to uh, parallel. There, there, um, there's one other one, Yorkshire, I think, um, but it's the sort of thing that you don't expect on a peasant rural side. And similarly, around the um, Willie Howe settlement, which you see on the map on the bottom right, um, there are a whole series of um, bullion Roman coins, silver coins, um, as well as a, an Iron Age stator, which we know the location of um, because the find spots have been carefully recorded. Um, they are unusual especially given the general absence on the site of bronze coinage they're not a hoard because they're found um, individually and in uh, isolated contexts um, and they're also as uh, andy will have observed just from looking at them uh, 
not going to hang together as a horde because there are uh, some late fourth century ones, there are some uh, very early ones, and there are some ones in between. But they appear to have been uh, very carefully uh, deposited, significantly not in the settlement itself, but outside, um, on the margins of the settlement. And um, at one level, what I think we're seeing here is um, the uh, deposition of objects um, in a religious sense, uh, very much in the same way as uh, the sheep burials at Hayton seem to have a religious aspect to them. But these are um, alien objects, they're Roman objects that are coming in to the landscape. And um, the sort of interpretation that I would offer for this very tentatively is that you have um, the upland population who are integrated with the Roman economy in the sense that they are uh, taking their sheep down to the lowlands um, and selling them to traders down there, feeding them into the uh, network that supports the towns and the military. But when they bring their um, wealth back into the indigenous community, rather than treating it in the way that um, the coins and uh, candelabrum and so forth were intended um, when they were produced as um, lighting the house uh, for the money for uh, uh, exchange and store of wealth. These are being deposited in uh, what I consider to be an indigenous way um, as uh, offerings in a sense to uh, the deities. And in this particular context, um, in view of an ancient monument at Willy Howe. So the objects are moving from um, one mode of circulation in Roman society or Romanized society, if I can use that term, uh, down by the roads and in the towns into a rural context where they're being reused and deposited in a particular different way. And that brings me back um, in the last image uh, to Rydale and um, the wonderful objects in this hoard. And I think uh, we have um, clearly the possibility that these objects are being deposited for uh, religious purposes, uh, something that I think is quite likely. But um, what I want to use the swing evidence to suggest is that that religious context may not be the context of uh, the Roman temple um, the, in the forms that we see it elsewhere in the province. But these objects may themselves be coming into indigenous societies and it being appropriate to bury them um, at or around a settlement as um, a different form of uh, religious observation as I think we're seeing at, uh, at, at Swing. So the seeing these as um, Roman provincial objects as they were produced doesn't necessarily mean that they were deposited in the same cultural sphere uh, when they arrived in Rydale sometime presumably uh, in the uh, third or fourth centuries AD. And in that sense, I think uh, one of the lessons of uh, the Rydale Horde is um, understanding the precise context, work is, I'm glad to say, going ahead, uh, doing geophysical survey around the fine spot of the horde. Um, and I hope that that will either prove me wrong or prove me right. Um, I would predict that one of two things will come out if the geophysical survey is successful. Firstly, I'll be proved completely wrong and there will be a fantastic plan of a Romano Celtic style temple and these objects will be um, votives that are found um, as, for instance, the votives at places like Hailing 
uh, are. Or um, I think more likely we'll find that the objects were buried um, just um, in an isolated context, probably on the margins of uh, settlement as I expect there to be settlements somewhere in the area because there are so many settlements in this part of Roman Britain, but not within the centre of the settlements, but on the edges. And per per perhaps, as in the case of uh, Thwing, um, overlooking some earlier monument uh, which uh, retained its significance um, into the Roman period, as I think is the case with the Neolithic barrow at Willy Howe. Um, in the context of the Thwing uh, area. So with that, if we pass on to the final slide, um, can I thank you for your kind attention? Um, I hope that, um, if nothing else, I've uh, raised some ideas uh, to make you go away, revisit that uh, exhibition in the museum and think about uh, the context of the objects and how they uh, might be better understood. And I finally um, uh, would like to thank um, all those who I've worked with over uh, many years uh, in the universities of Durham, Southampton and Cambridge, um, where a number of the ideas that I've been uh, sharing with you this evening have been um, discussed and debated uh, with a wonderful generation of students. Um, this is my um, last appearance as uh, the Lawrence Professor of Classical Archaeology. I retire uh, from that uh, post tomorrow. Um, so it's particularly uh, fitting for me to acknowledge um, and thank uh, all those students that I've interacted with since 1981. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much, Martin. That was um, fantastic. You took us from the lowlands to the uplands and have given me, um, I suppose, enormous food for thought. Uh, and uh, I'll be really interested to see as and when we have some results as to which of your two uh, possibilities uh, uh, we end up with. Um, There'll probably be some more, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just remind everyone that if you want to ask a question, please do. Um, please pop it into the the, the questions underneath, um, at the comments underneath the video, and I, I will take some of those and um, we'll just um, ask some to Martin. And just whilst they are um, they're coming in, I had a, a a question, I guess, which is just sort of inspired by your thoughts around roads and seeing sort of settlements along the sides of those. Um, one could read those roads as kind of uh, an imposition upon the landscape. Um, do you see the kind of settlements that are alongside them as kind of an organic response to those roads? Or would you see the settlements as kind of almost an extension of that imposition? Um, I, I see them as sort of organic. And mm. um, you see that very clearly in the Hayton landscape where you have an Iron Age settlement system that is essentially running along the river valley. And then the road is imposed and the uh, you could almost see the people upping sticks and moving to a more uh, economically um, advantageous location. And what's really striking about this is if you look along those major roads, um, it's not small town, small town with gaps in between. They're absolutely lined with this so it's a, an economic magnet if you like and i see it very much uh, sort of the growth of uh things organically as you were you were expressing it um got a i suppose a, a question from a uh, christopher ranger which is about the, the plumb bob which is one of the four objects yep. within the horde perhaps um and and which was just he asks, how do you think the, the plumb bob fits into the context of those other objects? I guess with the kind of maybe uh, use in building as, a, 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 as, 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 its, um, as its purpose in, in its life. Um, well, I, I think John Pierce on the PAS uh, suggests that it might be the wait for a goma um, where the, just, um, 
without getting too technical, to lay out a right angle in Roman surveying, you had a staff which had four um, strings hanging down and you lined the staffs up and they're at right angles so you can lay out a right angle. And that's what um, that's what I think John thought it would be. It, um, I've seen other plum bobs from Roman Britain, but they tend to be probably rather like your grandfather's, um, slightly less posh. Um, where, whereas what we're seeing here is something that's posh, and um, but we're not seeing the whole object. That's one of the things with the Rydale thing. We're seeing fragments of things, which is why I suspect that they're not to do with what it was originally used for, but they're objects that are being curated as part of things and therefore being uh, deposited in a particular uh, careful way. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a few big questions. I'll, I'll ask you the big question, but maybe uh, this is probably a lecture entirely of its own, but um, from David Breer, which is, you've done a lot of work in Italy as well as in Britain. And mm. uh, how do you find the landscapes in Britain and, and Italy compare? Um, completely different in, a, in the sense that, certainly in Northern Britain, this um, very huge density of rural sites you get the same in italy um but the italian sites are much much more monumental even the small ones and the material culture and so forth is is very different um and there is uh, there's much less of this sort of organic growth uh, into road systems and trackways in in italy um, thank you. Um, uh, uh, there's a question uh, from uh, Don Richard, which is, with settlement along the roads, would the army ever worry that they could be used as a place to stage an attack from? Uh, quite quite probably, but I suspect that um, the my view of uh, the, if you like, the war and peace situation in Roman Britain is that, for the most part, um, the natives aren't going to be untroublesome, but I don't think they're revolting. <laughs> if you see what I mean, <laughs> uh, and that uh, uh, for the most of these people, um, uh, you know, a unit of Roman soldiers walking down the road is not going to be a target for attack. It's going to be a target for getting their money, <laughs> um, sort of trading and opportunities, and it's that sort of thing where. You know, look at the Vindeland tablets and, you know, what they say about Aldborough is that the guy is claiming his expenses or whatever for um, buying wine and food there. So you've got, you know, some poor soldier who's been sent from, I don't know, York or London up to Vindelanda. And uh, the interactions on the road are largely going to be, you know, buying sandwiches and meat pies and wine and beer and so forth. And the local population, you know, are gaining from that and the army are gaining from that. Yes, maybe it's less less glamorous than some of us might have yeah. in our minds, but yeah, probably yeah. closer to the truth. Um, I, I had a question, if I may, which is sort of inspired by your um, sort of survey of, the, of new research, both your own and then others. And I guess, it, it's so if aerial photography uh, and geophysics have sort of really moved the conversations on in the last decade or two, yeah. what do you see, what, what might be next for helping us understand kind of, uh, or advance our understanding of the, I guess, the countryside uh, yeah, well, in the rural well, period? Well, the, the, the great idea that um, I had that then didn't get funded, um, and one of my former students is, I think, pursuing, is that um geophysics and geochemistry are great and we're using them very effectively um but all big farmers are now driving up and down in combine harvesters and uh large tractors uh with gps on them mm -hmm. and they are collecting uh geochemical and geophysical data uh because that's where you decide to put the fertilizer and understand what your uh, 
grain yields are going to be. It's relatively low resolution data. Um, you know, it's collected at 15 meter intervals or whatever, but it needn't be. And it covers huge acreages of landscape. And if we could crack the access to and use of that data, we would then be able to map huge swathes of the Roman Empire um, with someone else paying for it. <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> uh, that, that I think is the is the one of the next really big opportunities. Yeah. That, yes. Join all your many dots on the Roman yep. rural settlement. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we've got a, a question from Guy Harvey, which is just is whether you see any other cultural differences between sort of the hill people, the upland, and then the, the lowland, the valley people. I suspect it's um, dividing them in that way, which is convenient uh, rhetorical device for presenting a lecture, um, rather underplays the fact that they're probably very different local communities everywhere. So um, what you're seeing um, in different parts of the Wolds are probably uh, communities who are, uh, have different cultural attributes and so forth. I don't see um, the Parisi as one sort of unified group. I think it's going to be much more locally, communally based. And one of the, one of the I think, interesting challenges is um, using the material we've got to pick out those local patterns. So what you see around, you know, Hayton and Shipton Thorpe is very different from what you see around Holmes Spalding Moor, and it's only five miles away. Um, what you see in those areas is quite different from what we're seeing around Aldborough at the moment or up, up around Thwing. So I, I suspect that these you know, densely populated landscape with very strong community identities and quite varied cultural patterns that are going to reflect to some extent the different agricultural industrial traditions and histories and the ecology i think it's as archaeologists we see little you know shining bits of light on things which we tend then to generalize from and i think it's probably rather more subtle than that if i could put it that way that was that was going to be a question that I, you talked a little bit about kind of specialization of different communities right. in different spaces it um which uh, kind of runs counter to some of my understanding where you, you get a kind of i get a relatively homogenized view of things which right. is i think because i've i've had it through at least three levels of scholarship and some of the nuances disappeared um but do you think that if we looked with the detail that you have looked at Hayton or any of the other sites that you would see the sort of the specialization or the, the kind of the unique thing about any of those um any of those rural settlements in, in the roman period um is it just that we haven't looked in detail at all of the other places yeah. on our map well i think it's partly that we haven't looked in the way that we might but it's also a your your experience of thinking about it homogenized is um actually one of the typical problems of Roman archaeology, in a sense, that um, we've all been brought up to think about Romans as standardised. It almost, you know, uh, you, you don't need to think about it because they are standardised. Um, whereas actually the standard models we've got have been created by taking little bits of evidence from here, there and and turning it into something homogenous. So the you know, current um, research on the Roman army, for instance, is indicating that military units are actually quite varied in what they're doing locally and how they're using material and so forth. And I think it's changing the mindset. So rather than thinking Romans standardised, we think what is the old, what is the material telling us about what's happening in particular locales. Fantastic, thank you. It, it sounds like I might need to get myself some new textbooks and uh, do, do a bit more nuanced reading. Um, 
that brings us to the end of our hour. Um, so one of the challenges of a format like this is I, I can't hear, um, you won't be able to hear everyone saying thank you and giving you a round of applause. So I'll have to do it on um, on everyone's behalf. So thank you very much, Martin. Um, that was um, genuinely fascinating and uh, brought uh, made me think about the Rydell Horde in a whole new way. And I'm sure the same will be said um, for many of those in the audience today. So um, thank you for that. Um, thank you for all listening. <laughs> Um, and I will just finish up by saying we have a few more talks uh, coming up in the next uh, couple of months. So the next one is on the 20th of October um, when Adam Parker will be delivering a short talk about um, worshipping Mars, the god of war. So looking at uh, Mars within our collection. And then the next of our expert talks will be on the 17th of November um, at 4.30 when Anthony Lee will be speaking about um, dead gods and the presenting Romano British religious experiences in museums. Um, you can find details of those talks and reminders on our website. So the very last thing for me to do today is thank you once again, Martin, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you, and we will look forward to seeing the results of your work at Albra and Roman York in the, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.